I'm going to go ahead and get us started just in case any of you are also trying to get to the television lecture tonight. Um, welcome to Pondering Excellence at the Center to Support Excellence in Teaching. Uh, we set up these monthly talks during the school year to encourage the exchange of ideas based on a talk that a visitor, a faculty member, a graduate student gives to actually sit under the umbrella of Pondering Excellence. And tonight, I'm very pleased and honored to have Jonathan Osborne as our speaker. Jonathan has actually been part of the Center to Support Excellence in Teaching longer than I have, and is the reason that I even knew about the job, because he posted the announcement to a listserv that I follow. Um, so, and then I didn't apply for it, ended up seeing Jonathan in a meeting, not talking to him about it, but it made me think about the job again. I managed to email you, I guess, while the search was new. Yeah. So it's Jonathan's fault or credit that I'm here. <laughs> uh, so I'm particularly happy that Jonathan's presenting tonight, and I like the way he's going to situate science education so that we're both looking backwards and forward. Most of you probably realize Jonathan has had a long and distinguished career in science education, and he's worked in two gigantic areas, policy and pedagogy. In policy, he's looked at student attitudes toward science, and then in pedagogy, this may be some of the work he's better known for right now. He's done a fair amount of language and literacy in science ed, and then a whole lot of work on the role of argumentation, um, including sparking one of my favorite back and forth sets of journal articles of arguing about argumentation. <laughs> this one way just that I captured him. He's been at Stanford for a decade now, and we are lucky to have him here. He is moving into a nervous status sometime in the future. Yeah. July. Yeah, so we're, we're getting him while we can. So welcome, John. Thank you. You asked me to talk about it. Well, I don't know if I have a chance to do that, but let me find it. The sphere I've been involved in now for around 40 years in that sense. So uh, I'm going to give it's a very partial, subjective interpretation. Uh, I'm sure it's broad and we'll have the opportunity. And hopefully that will at least generate some kind of discussion. Uh, but I hope the view I'm giving today at least uh, gives you some sense of what matters uh, and, and in that sense, again, uh, I think the uh, quote we was really need to bear in mind, or I bear in mind, is it's, it's, it's not the quote from the history board, which is a wonderful film. If you haven't seen it, it's a play as well. But get the film on Amazon, uh, and it's really a really big one education. One of the characters there says, there's a story, it says, our perspective on the past altered, looking back, we can get some things to think about. We don't see it, because we don't see it, this means there's no period so remote as the recent past, but the historian's job is to anticipate what our perspective on that period will be, even on the past. And uh, I think that's part of the challenge that I've got with doing this, which is I'm looking back at Essentially, fairly recent past. And one of the challenges is essentially uh, trying to identify what is the same. So, it's my kind of uh, perspective on that, and what I think I think is the same way. And then I look forward to what the problem Okay, so one of the things in terms of building on this, I've had to be very fortunate in my career to work with. Uh, an enormous number of people who I've learned from, uh, people uh, like Ross Driver, who was very black <laughs> as my advisor, uh, these are all people at King's, uh, John Osborne, who was a great intellectual before Steve Norris, who unfortunately died. Uh, these are kinds of, uh, and then the students as well, uh, uh, from whom uh, I benefited in that way. I've only put the names down there for the world because I didn't have a graduate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still benefiting from my interactions with my students. Um, uh, and also, there's been an enormous change in context. Uh, I mean, actually, since this lecture was built in the late, because uh, I've taught for the first nine years, 12 years of my career, uh, and, and then went, got recruited to do teacher education without PhD. So it wasn't until I was when I came to the field, there were only these really four journals that anybody read. Uh, 
they were talking about this a bit. And, and they only came out something like 18 months a year, rather than 15 times a year. So it was possible to have a kind of overview of what the primary issues were in the field. Uh, and now you've got this kind of context has become the International Journal of Science and Education, and it's the part A and part B. You've got these other ones that have appeared. And one of the challenges for anybody, I think, in this field is just keeping some sense of breadth and available of what's going on. It's really very difficult to inevitably become siloed. Maybe. But I, one of the things I can try and encourage people to do is uh, to look outside their own silos. So, okay, looking back, you know, uh, in, the, in, in terms of my own perspective, I was trained in the day. I started uh, as a physics teacher teaching what was the equivalent of a physics. Uh, these are, this one is the, the junior high school version. And the version of that, I think. And there were some very sort of uh, good great uh, ideas in there, but it's not the same thing. And there were some sort of great ideas in there, but essentially, it's the central focus was on technology. And lots of clever, Devices and experiments were demonstrating the phenomena. Similarly, this unit on changing charts, wonderful innovative ways of teaching about statistics, probability, and measure okay, in a sense. But what was missing from that, what was focused on that, uh, were other things uh, that really emphasis on technology. And another thing which I think I often go back to in terms of thinking about. Which is not known over here is a thing called Schools Now the Council Integrated Science Project. Again, the junior and high. We had four units one unit called Building Blocks, one called Patterns, another called Interactions, uh, Energy. Okay. And uh, notice the similarity okay, with some of these cross headings. Patterns and Energy. Uh, and I'll return to that in a moment. But, uh, again, was innovative in terms of its thinking. It was challenging. There's an issue, I think, in the sciences uh, curriculum. You know, should we attempt to attend the difficulty, or should we acknowledge the diversity of that that exists within the sciences themselves? But okay, and the part about the natural course is the conception of pedagogy, driven by this particular mantra, which is sometimes a Chinese proverb. I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and understand. And basically, I think that I think what you say, it was fairly clueless about what it means to help a student to teach and learn a complicated science. Uh, but it was full of a lot of enthusiastic innovators and a lot of passion uh, around what we produced. Everybody, I think, got swept up in that. This is, this is a kind of simplistic aphorism that can't be hard. <laughs> okay. So it sounds like okay, so we buy into that one. Uh, but that, I think, is a bad problem. So I think when I came into the field, you know, what was influential on the learning of science was Piaget. And, and, and still lingering was the notion of Piaget's stage theory that children went through uh, what you might call pre operational phase and, and then a concrete phase. Although in a formal and abstract way. Now, I think um, he actually gets what I call a bad rap these days, but that's kind of unfortunate. It's quite clearly there is a message in the cashier, and that message is that the young child does not think quite the same. There is something that changes okay, during, during the process of growth, during the adolescence. Okay. And we know a lot more about what that change is than a lot of neuroscience, again, from all these kinds of synaptic forms. The, the floor of Piaget, to some extent, is to say that it's deterministic. Uh, and uh, in modern literature, it's much more complex. But nevertheless, I think what, it, what was important, I think, for me in that kind of early stage, and I think is undervalued and something I still look to, I think it's kind of most important, was the work of uh, Michael Scherer and Philip Haley, who basically said, well, they were Piaget, not Neo, not the Piaget teams, and said, okay, uh, yes, it's deterministic. But what we can do is we can change the rate in which students progress through these stages by giving them mental exercises that encourage, in neuroscience terms, to power and to encourage the development of students' ability to think and reason as 
complex. And this was a product called Thinking for Science. Uh, and one of the great things I think about Thinking for Science is that they went out and tested it. And it's one of these pieces of programs of research for which we do have definite empirical evidence that it works. So the body they captured here in this particular graph, I can't remember why, but it's one of the symbols on it. Okay, uh, uh, and what it's showing is that the value added by K sets cognitive acceleration to some supervision uh, in terms of the public examinations in 1999. And it showed very clearly okay, that what, if you look at the case scores, red ones, they are doing significantly better than the green ones, which are the control scores. Uh, and it corresponds to, I think, about half of the whole grade. The interesting thing about the work is that it, even though all the interventions were that, that program, <coughs> it, uh, there was a similar effect in mathematics. And there was a similar effect in English. And so what they claim is they have achieved a very rare, rare transfer of mechanism. Uh, and it caused a lot of arguments about mechanism. Nevertheless, what you have here is a piece of work which I think was systematic and rigorous uh, and showed what the, the value of asking students to engage in the science of uh, uh, Unfortunately, it never really, one of Philip's complaints in some sense was that he never managed to sell it to the American scientists. Uh, so why I think it's all but in some senses, it was also dealing with <coughs> other people with digital crime, uh, captured really by this uh, Ashwagandhian mantra, which is Ashwagandhian was a psychologist in the 1960s. He writes a book on education psychology, and has this quotation at the beginning, uh, which uh, for those of us who grew up at this time, okay, academically, uh, it was ingrained on our brains. If I had to reduce the whole of education psychology to just one thing, it would be that the most important single factor in person learning is what the learner more than knows, ascertain this, and teach it accordingly. So, what one got looking back, okay, uh, is an uh, enormous interest in what the learner already knows. Uh, really, uh, this is the thing that started the whole program of research to student misconceptions, student different ideas. Conception, what you call it. This was a paper by Ross Driver and Jack Lutz in 1978, in which they show how the students' conceptions frame how they interpret and understand and participate in that topic. And this led to an explosion of work. Uh, these are three sort of key central groups in this area, okay, published in the 1980s. Pupil as a Scientist by Ross Driver. Uh, learning in Science by Roger and Osborne, uh, as a New Zealander, and, and then the end of the book by Ross Driver. But there's much more than that. It was a journal dominated by articles about children's conceptions of apes, whatever it might be, to the point where actually people are exhausted by it. Well, not another article on, on this particular uh, line. You know? But nevertheless, it's in, it, it was valuable and important work. I mean, let me give you again my kind of personal. Uh, example uh, of this when reading the pupil as a scientist in the 1960s, uh, this came across something which was kind of used to bug me when I used to teach physics. We used to do this experiment where you would ask them to take a couple of magnets, put a piece of paper over them, and a spray line filings, and then you'd ask them to draw the pack. And what they would draw it was, it was obviously this is what they saw. But all the time you kept on kind of, you were looking at it saying, Oh, look, this is what. Okay, this, is what, this is what it needs. Okay. That kind of sketch of the back thing. You don't see that unless you have a clear concept of what is there. Uh, and that was kind of highly illuminating. It took me as a kind of unusual thing to be able to find. I used to think that there was obvious great effects and other groups of great effects. Other pieces of work is work which I did later on with Paul Black, um, looking at young children understanding this case of uh, persistent life. 
Um, and you ask them to draw things like what was inside their body, and it's quite illuminating in a sense of mystical example. Uh, because what you get is just a tube, you know, hanging up in somebody's stomach or belly, you get this long continuous tube, which is what they on, and two tubes. Okay, and why is it two tubes? When you think about it, it doesn't matter be a tube. Because you know, have in the language this idea that water goes down the wrong way. So there must be one right way and one wrong way. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and in some sense, it is an extremely valuable explanatory framework. We've also got much more interesting things like this. Okay. Where a company really had got to have a similar age with a very different sophisticated conception of the whole But the idea that basically there is a single tube that you get down here, okay, it's not something brings it to the fore. So what I'm saying is that I think this is a valuable body of work, okay, terribly important, and I worry sometimes that people might forget it. I worry that might forget it for two reasons, really. Okay, one is <coughs> I show this, and I guarantee that in half of you, that there is something in that. Half of you, this is just a mass of white and black dots. And who thinks it's a mass of white and black dots? Who thinks they can see something? What can you see? I see dots, yeah. I think, the ground. Yeah, yeah. You look carefully now, okay? <laughs> okay, there's a dog's head. This is Dalmatian, picking out a puddle there. There's the back, there's the front legs. Can you not see it? We well, can't blame it. Honestly, if it's something that takes three or four goes, it's something you can't see. It. But what it's showing you to the fact is, okay, if you're showing people phenomena, if you're illustrating ideas about the world, okay, you need a theory that makes sense. All observations theory that you don't know what it is that you're looking for, you will not see it in that way. Uh, and this is why I think this kind of body work is important. This is a paper published in 2013 by Phil Sadler. And what they looked at was the influence of digital knowledge and student learning in high school and science class. And what they showed is that teachers could understood and address student misconception of this kind in the kinds of the sorry. Their students uh, learn more and attain more. So, knowing about uh, student misconception is something that is important, which is why some of the more teacher education needs to address it okay, in ways that this is being implemented to a more degree. But that, I think, is looking back at an important program of work, which has left us with a legacy. And in one of the kinds of arguments I've tried to put to you in the context of this discussion is you know I always remember the world's driver being okay, <coughs> about something called something positive. And I said to her, okay, that isn't that just reinventing the wheel and she's wanked at me for anything that we can do. So that every generation has to reinvent the wheel. Well, and I don't think so. I think we actually have to learn from the body of knowledge we learn with the fact that we are and we can find what it is important. This is my kind of Okay, so what constructing a plan. So, my kind of epiphany or light bulb moment about uh, constructing a problem really came from sitting in a meeting where we all uh, were doing this research project with at least some students on the staff. This was the process of my generation. And being with, um, and we were also supposed to do an intervention to address that, but I was really called back and uh, called in Harlan to really need to do some. I'm kind of realizing that the way we do this, okay, uh, it came to working out what we should do to address this misconception. And it actually, I have to say, it's wonderful the impression when people really regard this kind of thing as easy as they realize that we do this here. And I think, you know, it basically has nothing to say about technology. Okay. How do you address this? Borrow from Howard Zinn, who gave the last slide. Okay, constructivism explain why, but could not explain how to present ideas. 
after many years of eliciting children's ideas, it might be a vast of knowledge of what we think, which would never give some So the question is, how would you do that? Okay, uh, and I think uh, that's to some extent where some of the questions come from. Now, I think it's important because I, I uh, coming of age, and there was an awful lot of what you might say attack on science at the time. Because mm -hmm. there was this kind of myth that the values of science were kind of kudos, communism, university, disinterested, and organized skepticism. Uh, and gradually, okay, uh, you've only got to look at any kind of historical record of science, particularly, say, the discovery of DNA, to realize that ancient science is often characterized by competition. Okay, the University of Mind Marge is important, actually, to develop this Western view of the world that uh, they're part of the nature of science. Okay, scientists are certainly not disinterested in themselves, organized skepticism, and it's about the evidence you hang on to. But, uh, you, there was a tax on science, this is Thoreau was very famous, uh, arguing in uh, the laboratory of life. Yeah, science is a form of fiction of this course like any other, one of which, one effect of which is the truth effect, which like all the true effects, arises from textual characteristics such as text of verbs and structure of pronunciation, without reasons for so on. Now you can imagine for most unerring scientists, this is like a great man to do all the work good. Uh, uh, it had consequences. What are the kind of consequences? Well, one of the consequences it has is we have to evaluate it under the attack. What is it actually that science has that makes it distinctive? And in some sense, it makes it similar to what's going on for a long time. But uh, I think, to some extent, the best answer to which I'm mainly to in some senses is um, Harvey Siegel's answer. There is no procedure that is constituted in the scientific method. In the scientific uh, and that would be well destroyed for long periods of time. Okay, going on. All that ensures that science is rational. What ensures rationality is evidence, or better, science is rational to the extent that it proceeds in accordance with such evidence. Now, Helen Longino, I think, here has that to say science is rational objective to the extent that it engages people in uh, criticism, and to the extent that it engages the all. But nevertheless, again, what it's saying is it's that commitment to evidence that's the basis of belief, which is really very fundamental. Uh, and, uh, you know, out of the sociologists of science, the kind of really kind of influential book in some senses, there are really the, 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 the several ones, but Pickering put on the angle of practice, pointing to the influence of practice, so I didn't stop that around the I don't know what I was going to go back. Um, is, uh, Really, what's been influential to some extent in the scientific practices. But anyway, going back just to illustrate this as a main thing, I like I, I, I love showing my favorite clips. This is from a wonderful uh, film called Life Story. And it's, and it's a two hour reconstruction of the discovery of the DNA. And uh, uh, it reveals science almost always without any do what's what's wrong. Uh, uh, but it, what it does is it points to the practices that scientists engage in. This is a very short clip. Uh, I go back. Uh, Jim Watson uh, is finally working out that building models is probably is a really important thing for science about the construction of models. And this is the kind of. Uh, sorry, my sound didn't go to the show. Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> and as Watson was to write in his book on discovery of DNA, he was rather modestly. Um, we rushed into the evil to the paddock to the okay, and, <laughs> and that's we had discovered the secret of life. Um, but once I think actually to some extent which was right to in that sense make a lot of do that but um, what it points to is this the vision of science as being a set of practices which is really uh, uh what the methods of body reflect upon. Uh, and it's those practices that I think came to the fore, I think, in kind of my thinking was twenty five was thinking you know, how do you put evidence uh, and the evidence of justification to the, to the fore. So you know, give you one kind of example. I'm kind of fond of asking this is a group of teachers. This is something we all believe in. Day and night, this is one thing. If you come and say to them, you know, even the science would say, why do you do it? Because there's a lot of good arguments against it, but do it with some groups. If you claim that the Earth's been in the black past, then surely jump up good man and send us one. So these are all arguments that this would be like. Anyway, this thing at that rate today only does sound out. As fast as we sound we should be going on. None of it asks you to work quite beautifully, but basically if you can take a hundred science students, you're lucky to be in uh, one of the days uh, what these buildings on the front of these buildings to be those paper images. Uh, shown at Pantheon in Paris in 1861, the plane of location of the engine that turns to the course of the day. Some friction is vivid, so it's not going to turn the engine, but it actually turns the engine. And you can imagine in 1861, people were amazed by this thing, and Russian uh, The other piece of evidence is pointing a camera uh, at the uh, old star, and uh, you get this complete uh, shock wave. All the stars are male. Now, this actually isn't conclusive evidence because it appears to be actually true. Either the ground on which that camera is sitting is male, or alternatively, all those stars go around that one star male. But it's a wonderful illustration of what's in the 14th century monk called Ocker, Ocker Teresa, uh, argued that actually uh, never make any light of the world yourself, never multiply the entities that your nose that are necessary. Okay, and the simple explanation is that camera on the ground turning. If we go to the other explanation, that can explain why all this stuff goes around the sun. Thanks, uh, But it's about um, uh, trying to uh, uh, present and say, look, we really want uh, or asking students to believe a set of ideas. Actually, if you think about it, uh, this is a kind of addition I often find out. I've been crazy on it. This is just some of them. I've got this stuff. Confidence in the influence should be the influence. You can build on that and build on the confidence in the influence. You won't deal with the third one, okay? Because that's one that takes us and has been the influence. But you know, they're just things like you, know, you look like your character because every cell carries a packet of little messages and bunch of messages. Just think about how many cells fall in there from each other and each other. Within that is a blueprint for the future self. So why should you believe this kind of thing? And you're only going to believe these kinds of things if you occasionally you're shown the evidence. I mean, a lot of the things we have to accept are quite funny. And this, I think, is really captured by Stephen Morris' presentation about life's presentation. And I think he's got an important point, which is to ask of other human beings if they accept and memorize what the science teacher says without any concern for the meaning of justification of what he says, to treat those human beings with disrespect and is to show insufficient care for their work. Treats them with disrespect because students exist on the moral par with their teachers, thereby have the right to expect from their teachers reasons for what the teachers wish them to do. It showed insufficient care for their welfare as welfare of students because possessing beliefs that one is un one is unable to test all kinds of things to be used in the art of the education. Now clearly we cannot go through the historical arguments for all of these beliefs. Do it occasionally. To never do it, I think, is called by our perspective. And this is, I think, something that really is driving uh, Ross Driver. She's done an educated thing for hours. She's put a project on the Institute of University of Science. She was fairly new, fairly uh, forward type findings. Uh, and this is also a very 
it's just been educating people about science, but they have this very limited uh, understanding uh, of the simplistic version of which is scientists do experiments and find out. Um, so the question was, how do we go beyond that? I, I think I, I'm sort of jumping around a bit, but this is really what she was pointing to in a paper that we published in 2000 was that as, at the center of science again, is uh, the role of argument. Uh, this is from the works of the um, uh, There are really three spheres in science investigation space, evaluation space, and the development of information. Again, this is what the common picture of what those scientists do is the instruments of investigation. But actually, this is a really important part. Imagining new ideas about how the world works. You think of a famous scientist. First one that comes to your mind, ask yourself a famous for experiment that you draw. And the dominant thing in your head is how it argue. But in order to determine whether your theory is right, most theories are wrong. And the history of science is the history of mistakes. We have to learn from our mistakes, and we learn from our mistakes by creating the art. So, this um, led to this paper, uh, which I think was trying to make the case for art. Uh, and uh, my advice to anybody who is writing theoretical papers with good sound arguments is to make good things for the Uh, that um, and in turn uh, led to other pieces. We, uh, she unfortunately died, but she left a legacy of this research project. That's led to this paper about the empirical piece of work that we had. What it would mean to implement this in the classroom, what type of effects it might have on student communication, and things which were generally positive. Uh, and that in itself led to a professional development project, uh, working with this with the ideas project. Science and ideas of this argument in the time. Unfortunately, I think uh, well, we basically produced this whole video at home. And that I was a good learning experience. We translate these ideas into something that wasn't uh, useful. Uh, you know, this is the kind of program that worked. Having got the PD, we uh, said, well, okay, let's see if we can. Get more teachers to implement this for schools with what I call a more distance effect to develop their competencies. Uh, and the answer to the community of competencies was not very successful. Okay, that raises all kinds of issues about you know, is it the nature of the task, the piece of architecture, which is to some extent fundamentally the antithesis of what most students and graduate students do. So, science is about lines and ticks and tasks. Argument and argument, or is it something about conditions of argument, which I don't have the answer to. But that's the answer. Um, and uh, that in turn uh, led to this work on my is here on the of validated learning nutrition and marketization of science, uh, which looks at this uh, and essentially is an attempt. It's a very good tool that first uh, but essentially an attempt to say, well, what is it that makes marketing? More difficult as you become more sophisticated in its complex disability. Uh, and now using it as a basis for other work in the next part of the system. So that's a kind of program of argumentation. So, do I think that area is important? Well, yes, clearly, because I've been involved in it. Uh, I do think, in some senses, it's, you know, has it gone as far as it can? The challenges that it's facing now, uh, I think, are going further. So, uh, turning to issues of um, uh, other issues that, that of research in general, okay, there are, uh, uh, and where I think, I think they're succeeding, where the challenges are. I tend to see uh, all education in terms of these three overlapping circles of curriculum, right, the pedagogy, which we use to inform uh, how we go about teaching and learning. There's a 
assessment of the What are the kinds of issues? Curriculum, I, I tend to think, hmm, I don't know. Okay, I've been involved in lots of initiatives, uh, as I'm sure uh, you have. Uh, the UK National Curriculum has an initial version of the country six. I don't think we've got the country six. Oh, I don't think we've got the country six. I don't think still is really a great way. There's our keep changing it. I was involved in, in that, I think it was 2001 version of this. Was a product of the report beyond 2016. I've been involved in the group that wrote the framework for K 12 science education, which then later became the BSX. And from each of these experiences, I have learned something. Uh, the PISA assessment framework is not really a curriculum, it is. Uh, and um, oops, sorry. Uh, uh, do I think um, I think curriculum is a kind of ongoing struggle, and the ongoing struggle again is basically the fact that if you look at the back of the envelope calculation, which has an ancient case there, there's somewhere around about fifteen hundred. People just put too much into the uh, And the consequence of that is teachers put up a catch on the basically force marks their students to put in the in the landscape. And no curriculum can really get out of that particular problem. Okay. Uh, the area in which I think there is a kind of like more promise that I've seen is the work of this. Which do more than just lay out the options. They are materials which tend to show you how you should be thinking when you come to that. And so the amplified curriculum, which is produced by young sources, for example, that work, but there are other things that work. Uh, so uh, and the other challenge, and you look at some of the fossil materials, okay, and it's basically too much. And how do you? <coughs> This to me is a challenge for us to do this trick, which is why I'm the one who came to the board because I don't feel very comfortable in that line. And so when you come to pedagogy, I think you have been gone the wrong way. Okay, in the past uh, 15, 20 years, we have learned quite a lot about what it means to uh, uh, help students to learn, build, and understand it. Uh, I think we have understand that essentially the Argument I would make is that there is it's not just about doing science, it's about reading, talking, writing, uh, and modeling and representing the kind of things that you can do. Uh, and I think, in my mind, very influential in terms of framing my thinking is this article by Nick Chili about active constructive interactive, showing <coughs> meta analyses that constructive activities where you actually produce something are better at um, supporting. Ones, interactive ones with essentially have to have all the humans who have to do something and talk about it, engage in discussion, are going to be better. Uh, and that I think says a lot about uh, the other interesting area uh, is the work on how to talk, use talk, talk by uh, Lauren Weston and uh, Sarah Bagger. This is a really common um, But the challenge for that, as people will know, the work in this area. The dominant form of discourse is particularly in science publication. Because this is something that by far is the most high art publication. It's given the audience. And in assessment, I think um, okay, one of the kind of big leaps forward is probably the work on formative assessment. Implementing and using that is probably a very long team because the function of formative assessment is to get the feedback. The trouble is, you can give students form assessment, but give them feedback. Uh, summative assessment, I think, is moving on. 
moving on in a variety of ways, at least with basically the effects testing more ways and simulations and that the language processing setting uh, and in that line you can it's quite interesting because a piece of work that we did recently uh, and this won't make a lot of sense to you let me try to explain it to you uh, we have two versions of questions again these they're 44 and 12 are the same okay. one is course choice and one is uh, normal Difficulty of course transmission here yeah, as well. Again, the construction of the version there. Okay, and the, if they were all uh, equally difficult, they'd fall on the side, any one falls on the side. So most of the course, most of them are over this way, but they do fall on the last. Uh, uh, so that means most of the course choice are these ones. What's interesting is the ones that are difficult constructed in quantum will say it's difficult force choice. So what it says is it's possible to devise okay, machine-based tests okay, okay, which test of course this is the test line session, test the full range of quantum information. Because the interesting thing is why these two are not the same. But I think you know this is a direction in which it says it's going and will continue to go. Uh, One should watch this space. Okay, so let me talk. I, 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 I know I missed out on something. Let me talk about my questions from the time. I'll go for another one. Generative programs. What's that I think I'm really going nowhere? Okay. Uh, it's an actually small science. I think it is the paper of Facebook's work on the internet. It's just complex. Okay, everybody wants to know the answer, but there is no simple answer there. You know, how you engage your students in science. These are the kind of seminal bits of work in this area. It's called the Alcessi, uh, which is under the official director of Christian Science. The article has been reported by the American Association of the University of Washington. And this paper went around the world and started in some degree. So that tends to be the focus. It's also underserved. And um, um, my kind of take on this is most pieces of work are just badly kind of written. Uh, there is no simple answer. I think what's interesting, and this is an example, a small scale piece of research which I think is tremendously illuminating. This was an undergraduate student. And she said, Well, I'm interested in my. Well, I'll do this. I'll go down and go to a private school with a white girl. We all going to get strings of A's. And I'd say, why don't you do science? Everyone is different. If I do something wrong, I'm science. Uh, and that, I think, is very revealing. The message that students are getting from the teachers is that science education is a preparation for a career as a scientist. That's okay, the wrong message. Uh, also, small, this is again, I think, part of the people who are trying to do around the country. What we'd like to learn about 108 items, no less than 80 statistically significant differences between girls and boys. There is one girl and a boy still is the top five. I think none of those are going to surprise you. This is the obsession with death and destruction. Okay, they are species of them. Okay, if you look at the top part of the bill, so they're different. And that, again, I think is important in saying okay, you ask yourself the most of the to what extent do they address the values of your interest, to what extent do they address the values of your interest. But part of the answer is to have a part of the information. Uh, other generative programs which I think, you know, I'm quite pretty challenged on this, I don't think they're really. Going in there, we work on science. I think we do. Uh, it's sort of like my mind is inspired by the most complicated and less actionable or skippable. Okay, uh, in formal sciences, we've been seeing a tremendous surge in activity in the past 30 years, uh, and that's very valuable. 
but it's very complicated mm -hmm. as it's such a kind of memorable, difficult experience to find out, difficult experience to get. So what the research is about kind of doing last Briefly, I talk about nature of science. I think it's a problem. Okay. Uh, it's really a problem, again, uh, for two reasons. Okay. First of all, science educators do need a method of training. Okay. This is the focus of training. Okay. Why do they need it? Because knowledge one has acquired without sufficient structure to apply it together is knowledge that is likely to be applied. An unconnected set of facts is sufficiently short time. And for most students, Sort of saying why is it important, why is it that matter? It's just a kind of slight step to the ultimate success. Uh, it's an attempt to challenge the idea, and, 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 and even the first one I disagree with. Most of what this scientific knowledge is produced in that is rock solid. I mean, there are technical aspects of it, particularly the population. What you're presenting in the school science is not that. And I think that. I kind of put keep making this argument recently that I find this intellectual intellectual styles of reasoning. That there are six styles of reasoning. Why do I like styles of reasoning? Because I think what it does is it captures the different forms of reasoning that uh, um, scientists engage in. Uh, and it also captures the diversity of society. Historical record, which is what it is receiving from the view at different times, mathematical representation of science techniques, experimentation with Galileo, hypothesis of formation of Galileo, taxonomy, things that really starts from the idea of God, patterns, identifying patterns, identifying what's out there, which are important, probabilistic thinking arising from Gauss, mass, maneuvering evolution. Not just Darwin. Uh, and you can track them in that sense of a great symmetry of what they come And uh, I'm going to skip the next slide because it takes too long to explain what I don't have time. Uh, but basically, what, what, what we do is use this to argue okay, those are styles of reasoning. <coughs> three things that they think that they have, what have here is a set of three things. And these are the three things that they have, what have associated with. What it puts to the fore at the end of this is the fact that if you want to engage in any of these styles of reasoning, there are procedural problems. Procedural problems. One of the big failures of the Plato doctrine is to send a lot of time documenting uh, what the conflict or conflict actually is. It So, uh, you know, that's um, uh, something that I think So, what about generative programs, ones that I think uh, are going somewhere? I do think the work on language and science communication is going somewhere. Okay, people are working away at it. Uh, you know, coming to mind is the JDM <coughs> One single team can bring science to people with stupid, better experience or better learning experience. Just to give them more opportunity to practice using the language. And how we do that, and how we enable that, I think, is something that we just have to carry on struggling with, uh, and which we have to convince the science education communities to do. Uh, and that's an ongoing struggle. Okay, any work on the, any of the following practices, because these are now in the NGSS, but we don't have a very deep understanding of how to teach them what the challenges are about them. Assessment in science education, that is always an ongoing challenge because basically it's hard. And so many people think, oh, I'll go and do something else. So if you work in the area of assessment in science education, if you're in a small community, you are 
and sort of thing. Each professional knowledge and professional learning, I'll say a bit more about that in a bit before practice. But, uh, um, so, modern science, while everybody can make sense of things, we have a challenge in how do we translate some of the findings of modern science into form which the students can uh, interpret and make sense of So, particularly in the area of genetics, which is uh, Understanding history and philosophy of science, I think it's just an ongoing issue and it's important. I'll just say a little bit about core practices and then I'll finish. For me, what's influential in thinking about this is this book. What Boker and Starr point to is that in any area, if you want to make it a profession, you have to identify the knowledge that you and you have to document it. You do that for three reasons. You document it enables comfortability of that business in the market. And I can say whether you are adhering to a market. By documenting it, it goes beyond the tacit, it becomes explicit. And thirdly, okay, it enables control because there's a documented version of it again, and you, as the architect, the doctor, are not doing this document. So you're doing it wrong. Now, uh, I think that's important in terms of you know, this. Don't read all these others. This is what the nurses do. They developed a thing called the nursing intervention classification system. It's about 150 to 200 procedures a day, which are written down like this. The practice is primarily <coughs> And again, if somebody's got hypertension, this kind of is a piece of and call yourself a professional, so at least count the box. But uh, the question is why do we have these classifications written down in science, teacher education, or teacher education in general? We can have 20 PAs and nurses in this country, but we tend to write one to say in anticipation of if you look at, say, that everybody should have an anticipation guide, you can call yourself a professional science teacher, but if this is what you should know, this is the fact. I think that's a challenge that the field has to take on. And since they're attempting to do it with core practices, but the problem with the core practices is that they're still rather vague and general. Okay, uh, I'm going to um, uh, stop there. I'm just going to slip to my last slide. So there are other things I can pick up. I want to talk about one though, because this is just. Awe and wonder is something which I think uh, needs more attention. This is something I'm trying to discover recently. And, you know, I'm very fond of the Dawkins quote there's an anesthetic familiarity, a sedative of ordinariness, which dulls the senses and hides the wonder that exists. And that's the sense that I'm too often in the side of the knowledge. Why is that? I don't know if it's a And there are some people in Berkeley doing work on wonder, and there's this other Greek guy. Uh, and they show that it has a positive effect. And the fact that that has a positive effect. Something which I think is of promise. But for me, this is the way I'm recommending that we find something that these bits come together. Okay, it's quite important to sort of think about. I might have said that. But anyway, in conclusion, and this is where my Russell talked about how I feel. Sorry, I had to be so. So I always have that scholarship. I don't know if you would like to see it. That's how it goes. So I'm going to answer any questions or take any uh, comments too. Thanks for the tea. <laughs> the nature of science to me ends up in degenerative because you end up with a list, okay? And which is said that these things should be taught, but there are two problems about that, okay? Certainly, they're just so general, okay? That's, that anyway, anyway, they're challenging, but okay, that's one thing. The second thing is how do these ideas come to us? And what is it we should be teaching about as children? Fifth grade, that's the idea of science with the next year. Okay, to what we should be teaching in high school, to what we should be teaching in high school. We can't argue that they're not always. 
the recent studies in terms of sun damage. Uh, I get worried. Okay? It, it is a challenge with the sun really tractable uh, I often say you would track all trades of the But I get worried by scientific things. I get worried by scientific things. And it's 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 a, a problem of our own education. Because we didn't know much history of science science. Uh, because uh, and it, it just all involves a lot of reading. You know, the reason we are making this argument for stars and reason is that what's so much easier than that. Okay, it's a parity of analogy, literally, I think, in the past. I came across this book by Pompey, and Pompey's been influential on other people. And then you start to say, well, what are the implications for it? In another interesting piece of work, I think, draws on this the science that was all to work on teaching teaching how we would be much better off again if we could set a lot of questions again not again which is the right answer and which is the wrong answer because uh, that would encourage people to be critical so I think I'm putting out there to say it's something you cannot ignore you need to attend to it from time to time and it's really about how do you translate to a form that is useful. I think what I'm saying is degenerative is the program really an enormous element so an enormous body of work on things and put this down as a marker and I don't think it feels that it's going anywhere and beyond where it was from to I don't think it's feel because one needs to have to be to that part of that part of that Talk about argumentation and sort of the role of evidence and science. <coughs> how unique that it, how unique you think that is to science, especially with, especially if you look at like standards for like English and the Common Core. There's yeah. like, even more of a push for like evidence, yeah. use of evidence. Do you see those as like, like, is that sort of a borrowing of, of of science? Is that like sort of are they to be separately? Like, I'm just interested in what your thoughts are on that. Uh, I, I, I see the uh, I don't know. Uh, 
It's something I think it's kind of very difficult, but I think one of the kind of really enjoyable books I read on the summer uh, was a book by my friend David Beckett called The School of Society. Uh, and what I recommend everybody to read it is uh, it's a bit of a book which gives education and it says that we really need to celebrate the business of society. Only a few years ago, education was a privilege for a white man. With an enormous transformation in what we are doing. But with that has come uh, a, a demand to educate at high levels, higher levels of higher level of thinking. Talking is very much associated with higher level of thinking. And I think this is where the drive is coming from. Uh, and I don't fundamentally see. Argument in science, there was a difference, it's all arguments in substance and not complex and so on. Now, I can't make a science of argument in some way, it's not science. And the way it's approached, I think, we all kind of get kind of ways of kind of doing things. Somebody shared with other wonderful videos that if you look up on YouTube, they have the, the space, I don't know, the Audi A6 space shuttle. It's almost been appropriate. So I think, I think if, if coming to that kind of general view, we have to raise our game. One of the ways of doing that is by focusing on um, I had a question that is a bit kind of larger. Um, I see, so styles of reasoning is derived from uh, work that has been studied how science has been. Um, what procedures and epistemic constructs science have been using, especially in Europe? Um, yeah, yeah, the question is right? question. Yes. So, my question is maybe not the specific six types of uh, scientific reasoning, but do does this idea, this structuring between ontic, epistemic, and procedural questions apply as well to social uh, science, or is it something that could only work with? Uh, Science. No, I think it applies to social science in the sense that if you do, if you do sociology, for instance, I think there are constructs within sociology which are terrible to understand, which is the question of the class, class of categorization scheme, for instance, is a And there are methods which sociologists would use, largely surveys, that uh, would determine what are the trends. But they've also used other uh, approaches. Uh, but then there's you know, the, the epistemology of sociology is a lot harder to nail down because it's something about testing what one perceives, i.e., looking for <coughs> causality. That's a very narrow thing to do. Case studies and stuff is going to be quite something that goes out of the world is correlation. Okay, so you have to understand the system cause correlation. I think you could apply it to other areas. And all, you know, all fields advanced by defining what exists. I thought your slide one was sort of degenerative and generative yeah. research for participate. So you sort of touched on what the criteria were, like on the one hand, the ones that are sort of too general, too complex, too hard to nail down, or are sort of like on this list, and the other ones are a little bit more uh, falsifiable, maybe, or uh, yeah. Like, I'm wondering if you could just like elaborate a bit more on, on sort of how well, I chose those. Yeah. It's kind of a bit subjective, but okay, there's no doubt about that. Um, uh, 
I mean, basically, uh, I, what I'm hearing from this work, uh, because I've had a kind of opinion to improve the quality of what it is that students experience. So the kind of basic question I always ask about all research is, how is that human health doing? And it's the magic of the it's the magic of science which can help with that and do something with it. If I was taking a translation, how is that going to help me to offer an improved learning experience? And by that, I don't just mean cognitive outcomes, but I mean subjective outcomes. It might be more interesting to people to think about. And if I can't find an easy answer to that, or a ready answer, then I'm kind of like, So that kind of the issue about science identity, so this is a, a kind of piece of work that's been around for the last years, and there are various people who do quite a bit of work on this one of the ones that was colleague of mine, Lee March. She thought a little bit about that. But I've just increasingly looked at it and looked at what they produced in terms of uh, how this might inform what happens in the classroom. And I think I don't find it very, very helpful. Whereas if I look at something like thinking science, there's a body of empirical evidence that says this works, this works, this works. It's sad that more people don't think that way. They don't think that they have enough criticism of it in terms of its view and its expertise. But it's very hard to tell. Uh, and that's really how I think of what is going on there. Now, if you can say to me, well, you know, I think this has more value. Sort of subject to supervision. Yeah. I mean, another kind of issue I've come across in the past is I think gifts versus journals and people who get articles in journals and people get edited. So they know that you're doing it, but you slip through the ones that you can see. Uh, and it, it, some of them you look at and think, why did you choose to do that? Why did you do that? It's not too bad. If you're a researcher and you're looking at it, you have to be one of those names that produce a good argument. Why don't we thank Jonathan one more time? Questions out in the lobby area, which will just continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Wonderful.